so in our last lecture we talked about the herpesviridae family and the classification of the herpesviridae family and the morphology of all the viruses which are belonging to that herpesviridae family now in this video we will talk about the herpes simplex virus separately so there are two types of herpes simplex viruses that is the herpes simplex virus 1 and the herpes simplex virus 2 let me change the color of the pen that i am using from a long time so let me make it red okay so the first and foremost thing that you should remember is that the herpes simplex virus 1 causes infection above the waist while the herpes simplex virus 2 causes infection below the waist so this is just like a hindi saying that this is a patthar par khichi gai lakir that herpes simplex virus always causes infection above the waist while the herpes simplex virus always causes infection below the waist but this is not this becomes sometimes uh, you know false in certain conditions you should you, you know you need not to know that those conditions uh, at the undergraduate level this is enough to know that the herpes simplex virus always causes infection above the waist and herpes simplex virus 2 causes infection always below the waist this is enough to know now there are certain differences between the herpes simplex virus 1 and herpes simplex virus 2 that is sometimes also asked in the why was so one should uh, should know the difference between the herpes simplex virus 1 and the herpes simplex virus 2 so one difference obviously becomes that the herpes simplex virus causes infection above the waist and the herpes simplex virus 2 causes infection below the waist the second difference and difference lies in the point of the entry into the body so herpes simplex virus 1 enters the body through the abraded skin while the herpes simplex virus 2 enters in skin via the sexual mode okay while the latency if we talk about the latency then we will see uh, in the pathogenesis of the herpes simplex virus that the virus undergoes latency period as well so for the time being you just remember the site of latency of these viruses when we come to the pathogenesis we will see how it goes undergoes the latency so the latency of the herpes simplex virus 1 occurs in the trigeminal nerve while the latency of the herpes simplex virus 2 occurs in the sacral ganglion now how can you remember that so when you are writing 2 it is you know it is a mirror image of sorry it is a mirror image of s okay doesn't isn't it a mirror image of s so 2 is a mirror image of s so when you are writing 2 that means it it occurs in the uh, you know sacral ganglion it, its latency occurs in the sacral ganglion while 1 when you are writing 1 then you write like this one okay so just make it little elongated so it becomes tree that means the herpes simplex virus 1 undergoes latency in the trigeminal nerve so this is the easy way to remember the site of latency of the herpes simplex virus 1 and the herpes simplex virus 2 now coming to the clinical features so as i have talked earlier that the herpes simplex virus 1 causes infection above the waist and the herpes simplex virus 2 causes infection below the waist so the symptoms or the clinical features of the herpes simplex virus 1 infection will all also be will only be seen above the waist and those of the herpes simplex virus 2 will only be seen below the waist so by that you can remember the clinical features as well so the herpes simplex virus 1 infection the clinical features occurs are like orofacial mucosal lesions okay orofacial mucosal lesions so uh, around the uh, oral cavity or around the mouth and in the face there is several lesions seen due to this herpes simplex virus and there may occur encephalitis there may brain infection occur with this herpes simplex virus 1 in the neonates plus there is molarates meningitis this is a specific name given to the meningitis caused by the herpes simplex virus 1 so when there is occurring this uh, meningitis once the uh, herpes simplex virus 1 is reaching to the csf that is causing the meningitis and from the meningitis it may cause the encephalitis so the in meningitis that is caused by the herpes simplex virus 1 has give, has been given a specific name that is uh, called as the molarates meningitis plus it may also cause the ulcers of the cornea that you will read in the ophthalmology in your third year the ulcers caused by the herpes simplex virus on the cornea next is the clinical features of the herpes simplex virus 2 so the clinical feature of herpes simplex virus 2 is that it causes bilateral 
remember the words mark all the words that it causes bilateral painful multiple genital ulcers okay so it causes bilateral painful multiple genital ulcers along with the lymph adenopathy plus it can also cause the neonatal herpes so these are the clinical features uh, in the uh, clinical features of the herpes simplex virus 1 and the herpes simplex virus 2 that is the difference between the clinical features of the two now on the chorioallantoic membrane so uh, uh, what type of growth is seen on the chorioallantoic membrane we have talked about the virus isolation where we talked about the chorioallantoic membrane also so you can see that lecture in general virology uh, playlist but here we have to know that on the chorioallantoic membrane the herpes simplex virus produces a smaller pox produces a smaller pox while the herpes simplex virus 2 produces larger pox how you will remember 2 is greater than 1 2 is greater than 1 simple so 2 is greater than 1 means larger pox and 1 is smaller than 2 that means a smaller pox so this is the simple way to remember that the on CAM the herpes simplex virus 1 produces smaller pox while the herpes simplex virus 2 produces the larger pox now uh, one question arises that what is the meaning of pox pox means pox is a very you know uh, uh, vague word that means the pox means uh, uh, pitting or the you know a uh, hole creation or cracking anything can be uh, you know uh, called this pox so pox has a uh, very meaning so here pox means pitting or you know hole creation in the chorioallantoic membrane that is the meaning of the pox so uh, the pox are smaller in case of herpes simplex virus 1 and are larger in case of herpes simplex virus 2 now when we try to grow them on the cheek embryo fibroblast what we see that the herpes simplex virus 1 does not grow does not grow while the herpes simplex virus 2 grows well on the cheek embryo fibroblast so this concludes our difference between the herpes simplex virus 1 and the herpes simplex virus 2 now coming to the pathogenesis which is very important of these herpes viruses so the pathogenesis how does the infection of the herpes simplex virus 1 occurs how does it enter into the body so we see we saw in the difference uh, also that it enters through the abraded skin so here also once there is abraded skin so that is the site of entry of the virus and it will not come from air now it will must it should must come from some infected person so once the infected secretions of any persons comes and uh, you know uh, comes to that abraded skin that means that abraded skin gets contaminated with the secretions infected secretions from any infected person then only the herpes simplex virus one gets entry in the body while the herpes simplex virus 2 simply gets entry via the sexual transmission so here the uh, hsv1 is getting entry into the body via the abraded skin and it replicates at the site and causes primary infection chota mota infection at the uh, site of entry now that is uh, that is not the site where it stops it goes further ahead in its way so herpes simplex virus once it is uh, once it has replicated at this site then it enters into the cutaneous nerve endings and that's where the real pathogenesis begins okay so once it enters into the cutaneous nerve ending then there occurs retrograde axonal transport retrograde means it goes backward through the axons so in the neurons it travels backward opposite to the direction of release of neurotransmitter from that neuron is called as retrograde transport in a neuron so here the virus moves backward in the neurons in the axons okay? so there occurs retrograde axonal transport and then by that transport it reaches to the dorsal root ganglion in the spinal cord where the further replication of the virus occurs so after further replication more replication then it undergoes latency in the ganglia the herpes simplex virus 1 
goes into latency in the trisaminal ganglia while 2 undergoes latency in the sacral ganglia i have told you how to remember the site of latency of these two viruses one when you are writing one then one when you are writing one then just make a little longer line this is one just make it little longer then it becomes t that means trisaminal ganglion and when you are writing two then you see that two is the mirror image of s so that means two uh, herpes simplex has two undergoes latency in the sacral ganglion so this is how you can remember now once it has undergone re uh, latency in the different ganglia then it should must reactivate now before causing any infection so that reactivation of these viruses in the ganglia occurs by the fever stress or uv light so once the patient is suffering from any severe fever stress or uv light exposure then these viruses get activated in those ganglia and after reactivation of the latent viruses these viruses goes back to the peripheral sites and replicates in the skin so where will these viruses go the sites on the body which are supplied from that ganglia those areas will be affected by the viruses because they can only go along the uh, nerve only now so from that ganglia the nerve are going wherever the nerve is going the viruses will go along with that so once they reach to a different peripheral uh, different peripheral sites on the skin they cause the secondary lions on the skin they cause the secondary lions on the skin so this is how the infection of the uh, hsv1 occurs now once the infection occurs we have the lab diagnosis also how can you how can we diagnose it we have to diagnose them before starting the treatment so for the uh, diagnosis we have to first collect the specimen we have always talked that in a, whenever you are talking about the lab diagnosis you have to first collect the specimen that a specimen here because they are, these viruses are causing skin infection so is the specimen here will be the scrapping from the base of the skin lens okay and then we have the staining and microscopy then we can do the staining and the microscopy in the staining and microscopy we can do jank preparation this jank preparation is very important very very important just remember the name that in case of hsp and hsp1 and 2 as well as in case of the varicella zoster virus which causes the chicken pox we prepare this jank smear this is very important can be asked in the mcqs so uh, we make the jank preparation and how do we make the jank preparation we make it by scrappings uh, staining the scrappings with the jinsa stain so we uh, smear are uh, taken on a uh, slide and then it is stained with the gym size stain and this simple preparation is called as jank preparation this is a special name given to the stain or given to that you know uh, stain of stained scrappings stained slides are called as jank preparation now when we see under the microscopy we see some specific findings with these infects uh, when this infects uh, when you know when there is infection of the herpes simplex virus those specific cytopathological changes which we see are four in numbers most uh, you know uh, most important are four in number so the number one uh, change that we see is this cowdery type a intranuclear inclusion bodies which are also called as the lip skulls bodies this is also again a very important okay this is again a very important uh, you know uh, uh, um, finding that we see in the under the microscope that is the lip skulls body these are the intranuclear inclusion body what type of cowdery type a so this is the cyto, uh, first cytopathological change is the lips called the bodies are seen which are the intranuclear inclusion bodies in the uh, stained scrappings okay that we see and second finding is the ballooning of the infected cells so as we have uh, as we have you know stained the scrappings then some cells must have come which were infected with the viruses and those cells appear very ballooned out they appear very you know swollen cells those are called as the ballooning of the infected cells then we see their margination of the chromatin 
margination of chromatin i am sure you must have seen the margination of the chromatin in the pathological slides uh, in your pathology classes so uh, generally my in microbiology it, it will not be seen but uh, obviously this will be seen only in the pathology this is done and in pathology this is uh, scrappings and these all you know uh, slides are prepared in the pathology so you will see the ballooning of the cells you will see the margination of the chromatin and uh, you will also see the multinucleated giant cells which are also called as the jank cells the jank cells so these are the four very important findings cytopathological findings that we see with the in, when there is infection of the herpes simplex virus 1 2 and as well as the varicella zoster virus infection so see i have written here also that the same four findings are seen in all of them so in all of them like hsv1 hsv2 and the varicella zoster virus in all of these three we see the same four cytopathological findings so whenever the question is asked from these three viruses you should remember these four findings these are very important findings then also we can do the third step that we can do for diagnosis is the virus isolation is the virus isolation so virus isolation uh, uh, for virus isolation we have to first culture the herpes simplex virus so it can be cultured in the human deployed fibroblast cell line human deployed fibroblast cell line and then how will we identify once we have cultured the cul technique of this culturing of the viruses has also been described in the has been described in you know has been described in the general virology lecture series so you can see it from there how we culture the viruses then we can identify by the cytopathological examination where we see the ballooning of the infected cells and neutralization test has also been described in the general virology by which we can detect the viral antigen other than that we can do separately the viral antigen detection the antibody detection by elisa and the molecular methods are always there to help us out so so by all these methods we can diagnose the infections of the herpes simplex virus this is all about the herpes simplex virus one and two the infection caused by them the pathogenesis and the latency site and the lab diagnosis how we will diagnose this infections caused by the herpes simplex virus so next we will see about the varicella zoster virus this is all about the herpes simplex virus